Kushina Uzumaki was one of the first casualties of the Naruto series. Dead on the day of her son's birth, the former Jinchuriki had the tailed beast within her ripped out and used to attack the village. This left Naruto alone and with nobody. Orphaned, he had nobody in the world. Minato had hoped for Hiruzen to take care of him, but Hiruzen was a real hands-off caretaker, pretty much letting Naruto do whatever he pleased, whenever he wanted. Only stopping by to check up on him occasionally and making sure that he wasn't doing anything dangerous, like drinking expired milk. Naruto's actions, early childhood, and much of his personality are owed to his self-raised style, with even Sakura mentioning that due to Naruto's lack of parents, he was rather wild and did things that commonly society would think uncouth. However, I always wondered what would have happened if Kushina had survived the loss of her tailed beast. I mean, it isn't impossible. One could argue that Kushina knew her limits. But let's stop and remember for a moment that Kushina was both an Uzumaki and was also alert at the time of losing Kurama. Naruto, upon losing Kurama, was in far worse shape, unresponsive, his heart having to be manually pumped by Sakura, and he still came back with the introduction of Kurama's other half to his body. One could argue his recovery was based on Six Paths Chakra, but the point remains that it is feasible that Kushina could have survived if she had Kurama resealed back into her. So for now, let's follow that line of thought and see how it might affect the Naruto world. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, Let's get into the video. Kushina and Minato were within the barrier and Kurama was attacking them, attempting to free himself from their grasp, longing for the freedom stolen from him all of those years ago by Madara Uchiha and Hashirama Senju. A slave to man, the tailed beast longed for freedom, freedom and retribution. But Minato, knowing that the balance of power between nations that Hashirama had set up those years earlier, as well as the balance between the tailed beast was in jeopardy, he resolved to seal it away. Kushina believed that placing the beast inside of her would allow her to drag it to the grave with her, but in a single moment of clarity, Minato began to believe it was not so. So, weaving the hand signs, he began to perform the sealing that his ailing wife was too weak to do. Snake, boar, ram, rabbit, dog, rat, bird, horse, snake. Clapping his hands together, the monstrous form of the Shinigami appeared, bearing in its mouth a sharp dagger. Kurama panics. Minato uses the power of the Shinigami to drag Kurama's soul out and plant it back into Kushina. Upon doing so, Kushina would feel her strength returning and she would revive, but this was not so for Minato. Having sacrificed his life for his family, he fell to his knees limp. Kushina would rush over to check on him and see if there was a way to save him. Of course, there was not, and she knew that. It was she who had taught him this technique, and currently she wished that she hadn't. She held him close. Minato! Minato! He would look at her with a slight smile. Take care of... His eyes would roll up and then he was gone. He wasn't sad though, he was happy. His role as a husband and father was completed. He just wished that he could stay with them and enjoy their lives. But the Shinigami was not merciful to any. Minato's sacrifice saved the village, his son, and his wife. Due to this, Naruto remains a normal boy and Kushina remains alive. She would be transported to the hospital with her child. Physically, she's together, but emotionally, she's in tatters. Makoto Uchiha appears with Sasuke and Itachi to check up on her and ask if she was okay, but the look on her face told them everything they needed to know. Minato was gone and she was left alone to raise a child, her first child. Mikoto would decide that the best way to help her was to be the friend that she was and help her in any time that she needed advice on child rearing or a shoulder to cry on. And that is exactly what she got. For a few years, Sasuke and Naruto grow closer together as Mikoto and Kushina spend more time together. Every so often, Itachi is there and plays with them. They become a band of brothers, but this, like so many other things, doesn't last forever. The Uchiha begin planning an uprising after the blame for the deaths of so many people were pinned on them. The Sharigan left present in the eyes of the Ninetales as the attack happened. The Uchiha were blamed, and the likes of Danzo, who viewed the Uchiha as a threat, began to push them away isolating them from the village and leaving them to rot in a forgotten corner of Konoha. Kushina was at home with Naruto, fixing something to eat when word came out that the Uchiha had been eradicated. She was surprised and 
Even more surprised to hear that it was Itachi. How could he? It should have been impossible. Itachi was not a greedy boy, nor was he prideful or angry. He was the definition of sweet pea growing up. He had so much skill and potential, but he never once displayed any sign that he could slaughter his own clan, his family no less. Kushina would cry tears of sorrow upon hearing of the murders of Fugaku and Makoto. She would look back to see if there had ever been any cries for help. She remembered the last time she saw Itachi. He and a friend named Shisui were there trying to get her to contact the Konoha Council on the matters, to try and sway the opinions of both the Hokage and Itachi's father. But neither worked, and she was shut down on both occasions by those she tried to contact over it. That must have been the turning point for Itachi. Had he killed the Uchiha to protect the village? She would storm into the Hokage's office and demand if Hiruzen had commanded Itachi to kill the Uchiha. Hiruzen, in the middle of a meeting, would have to wave out the entourage and silently wait to answer. His lack of words spoke volumes, though. Kushina was angered and sorrowful and disgusted. She couldn't pin it down to one emotion. You did it. You ordered him to, didn't you? Hiruzen would respond by telling her that he didn't know until it was far too late. Military action was considered, but that he hadn't made any definite decision. He then reveals to her as a friend that someone else on the council commanded it to happen. Donzo Shimura, the leader, or former leader of Root. He would say that Donzo commanded it to happen and that Itachi was indeed acting under orders, attempting to save the world from a new war. Kushina couldn't believe it. She said that there had to be another way. Hiruzen would admit it was handled poorly, and due to such a thing, Danzo was removed as leader of Root, and the entire organization was shut down. Kushina asked if that was all that happened, if there was more coming. Hiruzen shook his head. Kushina asked where Itachi was now, and Hiruzen stated that he had left in exile, going to the Akatsuki as a mission to spy on them for Konoha. Kushina was awestruck, wondering how, after this, they could ask even more of him. She pointed in Hiruzen's face and straightly said that Minato would never have let such a thing happen. He would have never let this slide either. Hiruzen sat silently, feeling the shame he so richly deserved. Kushina demands to know if there were any survivors, and Hiruzen tells her that Sasuke was spared by Itachi, who seemingly couldn't bring himself to kill him. Kushina would demand to know his location, and Hiruzen would command that she be taken to him. Hiruzen asked Kushina to keep it quiet, and was only met by the scornful stare of the red-hot habanero of the leaf. She would be taken to Sasuke, who would be standing there, expressionless and emotionless. He didn't react to anything she said. He only ever looked at her when she dropped down to his level, to which his eyes would look into hers, and Kushina could see the trauma in him. His eyes reddened and irritated from crying, from awakening his Sharingan. She would almost be driven to tears looking at him. She would pull him into her embrace, but he didn't respond further. She would choose to adopt him, and the moment anyone said different, she would make her classic Medusa face, something that told them just how strongly she felt about this. Taking his little hand, she would walk back to her house. Opening the door, she would step in to find Naruto still napping in his room. She would sit down with Sasuke on the couch and just coddle him, hoping that in some way her motherly affections might crack that barrier of ice that was threatening to overtake him. She didn't care if he laughed or if he cried. She didn't care what he did, so long as he did something. So long as he acknowledged his emotions like she was doing in liberal fashion currently. She would hold him close and kiss his head, telling him that everything would be alright. Still, he didn't respond. At about that time, Naruto would be peeking around the corner. Sasuke's here, he would say with wonder as he rarely saw him at this point in the day, and never without Mikoto. Kushina would smile and try to hide her tears and wave him in. Naruto would come over and crawl onto the couch. Hi Sasuke, what are you doing here? Kushina would clear her emotion-stricken throat and speak. Sasuke's going to be staying with us now. Naruto didn't understand it. Does his mommy not love him anymore? Sasuke would suddenly shove Naruto off the couch. Naruto would hit the floor and look back with both confusion and tears in his eyes, not sure why his friend had done that. Looking back, he would see Sasuke's emotionless face staring at him, only the slightest hint of a tear in his eyes. Kushina would help Naruto stand back up and check to make sure he was okay. She would wipe the tears slowly rolling down his cheeks and bring him back to the couch, this time sitting him on the other side of her, away from Sasuke. Kushina would state that Sasuke was staying with them now because she loved him and his mom couldn't take care of him anymore because of an accident. Naruto seemed to understand at this point that something bad had happened and that Sasuke was sad. Naruto would crawl over Kushina just to give Sasuke a hug and apologize for whatever happened that he didn't know about. Kushina would pull them both into her embrace, hearing the muffled groanings of Sasuke as he attempted to deny his quivering lip. She would tell him it was okay to cry and that she was sad too. 
From that point, Sasuke broke down. He wailed and cried, shattering whatever was left of Kushina's heart into even smaller shards. Naruto was not yet as emotionally conscious, so he wasn't crying at all, but his hug conveyed a warmth and stability that Sasuke needed, a way of telling him that there was no need to cry because everything would be better. This didn't stop Sasuke, though. The rest of the day was hard. Sasuke wasn't hungry and didn't eat. Naruto cleaned his plate today as he would any other day, and Kushina, well, she wouldn't eat if Sasuke didn't. So she would put them both down for the night, tucking them both into their bed and reading them a nice story, which Sasuke seemed to mostly ignore. She would dim the lights. Naruto conked out almost immediately, but Sasuke didn't even close his eyes, just picking his nails and staring at the wall. Kushina would wait there as long as she needed. She would stroke his head until drowsiness seemed to take over. Once he was asleep too, she would leave the room, closing the door behind her. Moving to her room, she would change out of her dress that she'd been wearing, but instead of changing into her pajamas as she normally would this time of night, she changed into a set of dark clothes before slipping on her sandals and zipping up an old flak jacket. Leaving her house, she began to make her way across the rooftops, keeping watch as she moved for any who might recognize her. This wasn't something she normally did, and truth be known, she had mostly resigned from her post as a Konoha shinobi when she married Minato and became pregnant with Naruto. She avoided the gaze of the civilians and the other Konoha ninja as she moved. She eventually came to a stop at the abandoned compound where the Uchiha had once been. She stepped in and was overtaken by the potent scent of metal from the blood. While the bodies were gone, the stains left from the wounds were still there in the dirt, awaiting a summer rain to wash them away. She stayed on guard, but didn't bother being too cautious, as she was a member of the Leaf and still technically a shinobi, meaning she had every right to be there. She wanted to investigate. It wasn't about figuring out why or who anymore, but how. She wanted to know how they did it, and further, where they were. Her good friends lived in this village, and she had watched over Sasuke for many years after his birth, as Makoto wanted to continue her shinobi career alongside Fugaku. They were basically family to her, and they had been ripped from her in a cruel and gruesome way. Even if there was a coup planned, there was no reason to target non-combatants, women, and children while pacifying the revolt. That was tantamount to a war crime, and had been committed by the village's own leadership. She wanted to expose this to the village and force accountability by the government. The Uchiha, Itachi, and even little Sasuke all deserved that much. As she skulked through the streets, she'd find herself before the home of Fugaku, the clan head. She would enter the building. It was dark and cool as the summer night's wind blew through the open shoji screen doors. Looking about, she saw a set of footprints, shinobi footwear tracking blood down the stairs. Itachi's shoes. The stairs creaked as she went up them. Reaching the top, she found a hall with many rooms. She entered one and found so much blood that it looked like a butcher's shop. The smell of blood was so thick that it nearly choked her. Making it to Fugaku's desk, she began to look through his papers. Invoices, reports, anything that a clan head would normally have. But what she was really searching for was anything on the Anbu Black Ops, specifically the Root Division. She wouldn't find too much in the way of info on Root. They were good. Too good. But she would also check Itachi's room. He would have zero information on Anbu, as anything he was given to read was required to be destroyed after he had finished reading it. At a loss, she attempted to remember her husband's connections and would make her way back home for the night, where she would rest and consider her next plan. Not long thereafter, she would take the next chance she received to go out on the town and speak with those she knew about the Anbu. The first person she would go to contact being Kakashi Harake, who had recently been released from the Anbu by Hiruzen. She would contact him and invite him out for lunch. Kakashi would show up, cautious but intrigued. Kushina would begin by making small talk and trying to seem as if she were attempting to just catch up with an old friend, but Kakashi wasn't buying it. He had never been close with Kushina. Why would she want to see him? He would ask her directly what she wanted and Kushina, feeling as if his Sharingan were peering straight into her mind, would speak frankly. I want information on Root. Kakashi would ask why she was looking for Root and she would state that she had hoped to learn the truth behind the Uchiha massacre. Kakashi would state that the simple truth was that Itachi had killed them. Kushina would state that she knows it isn't true and would like to know where there's a base. Since Root is disbanded, she wants to find their base of operations and take a look through their papers and scrolls. Kakashi states that even if Root is disbanded, they're still part of the Anbu, and as such, everything they did was classified on the highest level. It wasn't something that she, even the widow of the former Hokage, could just get her hands on. He would tell her to just forget about it and go home, but Kushina would stand. They made him do it, she would say. They forced Itachi to kill them. Kakashi would look back. What did you say? She would continue. There was a coup planned. 
Hiruzen was making plans to deal with it peacefully and Root commanded Itachi to slaughter them all, including the women and children. Only Sasuke survives and he needs to know this. He needs closure. He, Itachi, and the Uchiha deserve justice. I won't abandon them. Not now. Kakashi would think about it. Her dedication to her friends was admirable and maybe he was just growing soft. Perhaps it had to do with what Obito had said. He had no clue why, but the moment that she said she wouldn't abandon them, it resonated with Kakashi's own personal Nindo. And so he decided to help her by telling her of a single location where she should be able to find mission reports and various other documents based around what happened that day. He would point out an abandoned facility and tell her to try there as well. So one night, after putting the children to bed, she snuck out of the house and began to make her way there. The facility was in the mountains, outside the village. Kakashi had advised her to be careful just in case there were traps. She needed to pay attention to tripwires, pressure plates, proximity-activated paper bombs, and various other traps. She was making her way through and at the time wondering why she couldn't have been born half Hyuga. She could really benefit from that right now. As she drew closer, she was astounded to find that this facility wasn't actually abandoned. In fact, there were Anbu there. No, they didn't possess any tattoo on their shoulder. These weren't Anbu, these were Root. She considered turning around and leaving, but suddenly she was gripped by two shinobi around her arms. They dragged her down the mountainside towards the facility where they brought her in. There they would find the masked members of Root slowly combing the facility. They would take her to Donzo, who would look down on her, his eyes squinted to the point that it looked closed. She sat there for a while, looking up at him before he finally broke the silence. What is the red hot habanero of the leaf doing this far from the village? She would smirk. Just a leisurely nature scroll. Donzo would take her kunai holster. A leisurely nature scroll, in full armor with weapons. She would shrug. It's dangerous these days. Never know when you're going to run into a genocidal maniac. Donzo would smile at this. So that's what you're after. Information on the Uchiha clan downfall. Why do you need that? It's already known what happened. Itachi Uchiha, having been offered a better deal by another village or party, decided to kill the Uchiha to weaken Konoha. She shook her head and spoke through her teeth, spitting each syllable. I know what you did. Danzo's smile faded as he listened to her continue. I know you killed the Uchiha. I know you ordered Itachi to do it. Hiruzen confirmed that much. Danzo would roll his head on his neck. That old fool can't keep his mouth shut. It's why someone like me needs to exist, and why someone like him shouldn't be Hokage anymore. Kushina, in her anger, asked why the women and children had to die in the attack, and Danzo would then tell her that he needed to be sure that not a single Uchiha remained. So long as they stuck around, Konoha would never know peace. He would command the men to raise her to her feet. Still, he would say, I can't let you leave here with the information you seek. Kushina would growl, You plan to kill me then? Danzo would laugh, Heavens, no, if you were able to find this place, then someone must have told you where it was. If we kill you now, your partner will simply expose your business and thusly expose us as your murderers. I had something else in mind. He would hold out his hand and receive from one of his underlings a dossier on the Uchiha clan downfall. He would hold it in his hands and look to Kushina. This is the only copy of the event. Everything in here is the raw, unredacted form. With this single folder, you could ruin the entire village's trust in its leadership. Suddenly, he lit it with fire-style chakra and dropped the dossier on the floor and let it burn to ashes. Kushina would watch as it burned, seeing her only hope of getting justice for the Uchiha go up in smoke. They would then take her out of the facility and let her go. Kushina would make a long trek home where she'd collapse on her bed without even changing out of her gear. She would look up to the ceiling. Minato, what am I supposed to do now? She would wait as if ready to receive an answer, but when none came, she would turn over in the bed take up the pillow that used to belong to her husband and pull it into her embrace, burying her face into it before falling asleep. The day after, she would get up and make breakfast for Naruto and Sasuke before sending them off to the academy. While they were gone, she would go about her day normally, buying groceries, cleaning the home, all while thinking deeply on the lost cause that was the Uchiha massacre case. Working with fervor, she finished the daily chores, and with that out of the way, decided to treat herself to a bowl of Ichiraku ramen. Leaving her home, she would make her way to the tiny shop out in the middle of the village. It had been a favorite spot of Minato and hers, and had blossomed into a perfect date spot and break restaurant for the shinobi both on and off duty. She would go in and order about four bowls. She still held the record. Every time she ate the Naruto Maki in the middle of the soup, she couldn't help but think of her family and any possible universe in which they were all still together. As she silently ate her bowl, another figure would walk in and sit down next to her, ordering one bowl of whatever she was having. The masked figure would look at her, his silver hair standing at a strange angle. Did you find what you were looking for? Kushina would look to Kakashi. No, the abandoned facility wasn't as abandoned as we thought. 
Donzo burned the Uchiha Downfall dossier right in front of me. The only written record of those true events. Gone. Kakashi would scoff. So? Kushina would look at him out of the corner of her eye and gesture with her shoulders. What am I supposed to do then? The evidence is gone. Kakashi would lay his head back on his shoulders and sigh. You were the Hokage's wife. You should know the answer to this. What is it? She asked. Kakashi would look to her. There are always two sets of documents whenever the Anbu perform a mission, especially if it was high profile like this one. He risen heard about it and began shutting down Root. You think he isn't going to have a file on it to base his decision on? Donzo is bluffing, trying to make you take your eye off the ball. This evidence you want still exists, you just gotta find it. Kushina was floored by this new information. Damn, I should have known that. She would put some money on the table, paying for hers and Kakashi's meal before storming off out of the shop. Thanking Kakashi as she raced out with speed even the yellow flash of the leaf would blush at. Returning home, she would wait until Naruto and Sasuke fell asleep before making her way out. Her next stop was the Hokage's residence. As night fell, she waded into the deepest part of the night when she knew Hiruzen would be asleep. She would sneak in through a window, and there sat the scroll of seals, right out in the open. Kushina would scoff at how loose security was. Why, any down-on-their-luck academy student could just waltz in here under orders of a shifty chunin and take it. If this was any indication of how easy it would be, she shouldn't have any issue taking the dossier. She began by looking in the Hokage's office, careful of any traps. Doubtless, nothing could be this easy. She would notice in the drawer as she planned to open it a magnetic alarm device, designed to activate the alarm the moment the metal plate on the drawer were moved away from the magnet. She would pull a knife from her belt and wedge it into the drawer to keep the magnet from activating the alarm. She would then search the drawer but would find nothing pertaining to the Uchiha. She would then check the other drawers, also finding nothing whatsoever. But Kakashi was adamant that it would be here, so where would it have been? She then decided to check the records room. She would sneak through. This is where it got a little rough. There were armed guards walking through the halls, and she needed to avoid them to get to the records room. Sneaking her way through, she would see two guards coming from either direction, leaving her nowhere to go. Instinctively, she jumped and wedged herself between the two walls just below the ceiling. She looked down, struggling to keep herself up, realizing that her lack of training had indeed left her weaker than she'd like to admit. A bead of sweat rolled down her nose, and she silently prayed that it didn't fall as she watched it. The guards stopped underneath her, and to her horror, they began to talk about their day, the news, and one particularly about his new girlfriend who he just found out was pregnant with their first child. Normally, she'd be happy to hear this, but this was not the right situation for her to congratulate them. She needed to find a way out. She began looking around. Suddenly, that bead of sweat dropped from her nose. As the shinobi talked below, the drop of sweat landed down atop his shaved head. He would wipe it off with his hand and look up, but see nothing there. Must have a leak. He hadn't noticed the vent's face closing. She made her way through the vent, which she felt was a better way to navigate as it was unpatrolled and led everywhere. She would need to remember this the next time she had to infiltrate somewhere, which she hoped might be never. Making her way into the records room, she quickly began looking through the records for anything pertaining to the Uchiha. She would find a file. Opening it up, she would find a full report on Root's actions and the massacre. Beyond the contents of the dossier, she also had the report on the investigation, as well as Konoha's attempts to cover it up. Hearing footsteps approaching, she would close the file cabinet, perhaps a little too loudly, and jump back up into the vents. The doors would open as a guard looked around. Satisfied that nothing was wrong, the guard would leave. Kushina would then make her escape and make her way back home with the file in her hands. Entering her abode with a pep in her step, she would turn on the lights only to find her home ransacked. Her heart almost stopped. Without a thought, she turned and ran to the back, basically kicking the door in. Please still be there. Please still be there. She peered into the children's room where she'd find an empty bed, the sheets all messed up and half on the floor. She grunted in worry and frustration as she would catch a glimpse of a masked man outside the window. She would basically jump out after him, kunai in hand. The man would jump up on the wall. I have a message for you from Donzo. If you ever want to see the children again, bring the dossier to the Will of Fire Monument, or there'll be two fresh bodies in the waterways by sunrise. The man would disappear. Kushina, in her rage, would kick a bucket so hard that it would smash into a thousand pieces, tearing into the wall and ripping off part of the stone. She would look at the dossier. Sasuke can't use justice if he's dead. She would sigh and begin to make her way to the disgust location. There, she would find Donzo flanked by two guards, as well as a single root shinobi holding both a struggling Sasuke and a crying Naruto. She reassured them. It's okay. Mama's here. Donzo would step forward. Yes, no worries. Mama is here, and so should be the dossier if she has even half the brain the fourth had. Kushina held up the file and threw it to the ground in front of him. He would pick it up and put it into his robe. He would turn around to leave, raising a hand into the air. Kill them. 
Kushina would raise her hands and throw six shuriken at the shinobi holding Naruto and Sasuke, taking them out. She ran toward them and they towards her. One of the guards threw their own shuriken at the group. Kushina saw it coming and it was as if the world were moving in slow motion. She cried out for them as their hands raised up to take hers. Suddenly those shuriken were knocked out of the air by a flurry of kunai. Kushina took the children into her embrace and covered them with her body while looking around. Standing in the distance was a single man with glowing red eyes and a black coat bearing crimson cloud patterns on it. She would exclaim in shock, Itachi! He would jump down. More root shinobi came out of the woodwork to attack Itachi, giving Kushina time to get Sasuke and Naruto to safety. She would tell them to wait nearby for her but to take cover. Naruto and Sasuke would nod and wait. She would turn and rush back out to help Itachi. There she'd be stopped by Danzo. You could have left this alone, Kushina. None of you would have had to die. Kushina would angrily call out to him that Makoto and the other women and children of the Uchiha didn't have to die either. Danzo would reply that they were a danger to the village as is she, Naruto, Sasuke, and now Itachi. They all must perish. Kushina, utterly enraged by this man's lack of morality to the point of threatening and killing children, unleashes a power deep within her. Her hair stands up and begins to flow like a thousand snakes as thick whisker-like lines form on her cheeks. Her pupils take on the slits of a fox's eyes as her fingernails become more like claws. She rushes at Donzo, but Donzo is ready with his wind-style chakra blade. He cuts her to ribbons, but the Ninetales chakra begins to regenerate her wounds. Donzo removes the wrappings from his arm and displays an arm embedded with Sharingan. He would begin to use them one by one to survive fatal wounds, something Itachi notices as he joins the fight. He would see Kushina struggling and would work on his last resort. He would flip over Donzo, kicking his leg out from under him before stabbing him in the heart. Donzo would simply disappear and reappear somewhere else and continue his assault. Itachi would turn and continue to fight with him, dishing out attack after attack and taking it before jumping over Donzo, sweeping his legs again and stabbing him in the heart once more. Donzo would disappear and begin attacking again, but by this time it's too late. He's already caught in Itachi's grasp. Itachi explains that Donzo's greatest boon has just become his greatest weakness. As the Izanagi was created to escape fate, Izanami was created to enforce it, and Donzo had just been cast under it, forced to relive the moment forever until he accepts his fate, which he likely never will. So as time on his many Izanagi runs out, he would finish him off as he remains trapped in the Genjutsu. Itachi's eye would go dark as he turns back. He sees Sasuke and stops, ready to leave. Kushina would stop him and bring him over. Sasuke is mixed between sad and angry, his face displaying fear as he steps back, but Kushina reassures him by informing him that bad people made Itachi do bad things. Itachi would embrace his little brother. From this point on, Kushina reveals to the public the truth, and the citizens of Konoha aren't happy about it. They force Hiruzen to resign and force out the council members. Kushina is placed as the next Hokage for a time, but she doesn't really want the job. The people wouldn't have it any other way and the daimyo approved, so she would hold the job until someone else would take it. During that time, she would wipe Itachi's slate clean and allow him to return as a Konoha shinobi if he so wanted. She would allow him to begin mentoring students and would put him in as the head of Team 7, consisting of Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura. He leads them well. Eventually, Kushina steps down and has Tsunade replace her. Itachi is revealed to be terminally ill, but through the work of Tsunade, a cure is found and Itachi is healed. It's with Itachi's help that Konoha is protected from many threats, from Orochimaru to Pain. And together they manage to stop the Eye of the Moon plan through bringing Orochimaru and Kabuto to justice, thus forcing the Akatsuki to come for Kushina, but Konoha is ready. The threat of the Ten Tails never returns, and when the Otsotsuki appear to continue the plot, they'd be put down by the combined efforts of Kakashi, Itachi, Naruto, and Sasuke, the latter two showing their true potential under the guidance of their mentors. And that is the end of the story. I won't lie, I had a lot of fun telling this one. I felt like going off the beaten path and forging into a brand new detective story. Kushina as Batman. Maybe film noir. Originally, it was just going to be a single part of the story, but it blossomed into its own little filler arc, and I was just having so much fun with the idea that I decided to keep it. Hope y'all don't mind. To be honest, I worried that Itachi appearing in the end might be a little cheesy and forced, but after some thought, I believed it would work well. After all, I sincerely believe that Itachi has been watching Sasuke from day one with his crows. And in the event that Sasuke is ever in danger, I feel like Itachi would return to help him. After all, he did what he did specifically to protect his brother, so I don't really see Itachi just letting Sasuke get captured and dying at the hands of Danzo like that. Anyway, I want to know what your thoughts are on the matter. What do you think would have happened? What was your favorite part? Would you have done anything differently? And if you have more ideas like this one, then also let us know. Did you enjoy our video? 
Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.